Welcome to the Audacity to Podcast, episode 190, How to Deal with Negative Feedback. Thank you for joining me for the Audacity to Podcast. I'm Daniel J. Lewis, and this is the award-winning how-to podcast about podcasting. It's where I give you the guts and teach you the tools to launch or improve your own podcast for sharing your passions and finding success. You have probably received a negative review before, or a mean email, or some kind of nasty comment on your website. If you haven't yet... Believe me, you will. At some point, you will. And don't let that discourage you at first because a negative piece of feedback is a sign that you are growing because the more your audience grows and the more influential you become, the more divisive you will also be in some ways that there will be people who won't like you. And so this episode is going to be all about how to deal with that negative feedback that you'll receive. I have 10 different tips for you, and these are actually steps you can follow through this process of when you receive some negative feedback, how to go through and handle this negative feedback in a way that you'll actually benefit from this And your audience, and maybe even that person who sent you the negative feedback, can benefit from this. And this doesn't matter really how you're producing content. This could be a blog, a YouTube video, a podcast. You'll get negative feedback because of the nature of growth. And one thing to keep in mind before I get into these tips, I'm going to be using a lot of we pronouns instead of you or I in this because a lot of this is a collection of reminders for myself as well as things that I want you to learn. And one major point that I want you to carry through all of this is it's better to be hated for who you are than to be loved for who you are not. And after I give you this full list, I'm going to share with you my negative reviews for the Audacity to Podcast and walk you through some of the things that I've learned from them so you can see a transparent, authentic, and even in some ways vulnerable perspective of how I podcast and what you can learn with dealing with negative feedback from my own experience. So here we go. 10 ways for how to deal with negative feedback. Number one, don't get depressed from negative feedback. This is, I think, our first reaction that when we see someone say something negative about us, about our podcast, or about our content, wherever it is that they leave this negative feedback, we can sometimes feel like failures We can feel like, what's the use? Let's just stop podcasting or even feel like doing something destructive. But don't give in to that form of depression. Don't let this keep you down. Yes, words can hurt. They'll hurt a lot more than sticks, stones, and broken bones. But we must get past that first reaction of feeling depressed because of the negative feedback And a way to help you with that is to realize some truth, some realities. The world is not out to get us. And this one negative comment from someone is probably a very small percentage of all of the comments you've received and all of the others are positives. It's very easy, though, for us to focus in on that negative feedback. We could have a hundred positive pieces of feedback and one negative feedback And we'll feel like complete failures because of that one. Or we may risk alienating the 100 other listeners in order to try to appease the feedback of that one listener who may have actually stopped listening. So don't get depressed from this and realize that the more popular we get, the more negativity will attract. So when we receive negative feedback, That's a sign of growth and progress. Be happy when you receive that first piece of negative feedback, unless it's your very, very, very first piece of feedback, but most likely you'll have some positive feedback in that early collection of feedback. So this is number one, don't get depressed from negative feedback. Number two, don't feed the trolls. There can be many reasons for someone to write something unkind on your podcast, leave a stupid YouTube comment or anything like that, that really attacks you. It could be that they're just having a bad day and they're kind of out to get someone or take it out on someone else. They could have a completely wrong perspective. Maybe they're feeling competitive. Maybe they have the scarcity mindset where they think that if you get a bigger piece of the pie, then that leaves a smaller piece for me. 
Or maybe they're just a plain troublemaker. We call these trolls. And feeding the trolls is not going to help in any way. They get some kind of sick pleasure out of the frustration that they cause. They enjoy breaking the rules and annoying others. They enjoy acting childish. They enjoy being disrespectful and contentious. There's nothing we can do to change their minds. So don't waste your time and energy on these trolls. I remember during one of my live podcast recording events, there was someone that kept coming into the chat room and using profanity, and they would make their name, all of these things that the chat room was blocking, but they would do all of these things to work around it and ways to try and circumvent the filter, and I would block their IP address, and then they would use some proxy and jump over to another IP address, and so I just decided, it's fine. I'm not going to give them any more time and attention. They enjoy this attention they're getting. I'm not going to feed them. They are a troll. Don't feed the troll. That's number two. Don't feed the trolls. Number three, pause. Before moving on, I just gave you two things to not do. And before moving on to the things that you should do, this is the first step, and that is pause. P-A-U-S-E. That stands for something that I'll get into in just a moment. But first, do actually pause. Don't reply right away. Don't get passive aggressive because some people I know really struggle with passive aggressiveness. And also don't start begging or for patronization from all of your other fans and friends and all of that. Just take some time. Take at least a day before you do anything with this negative feedback. I really recommend to take three days before you do anything with this negative feedback. The harder it is to receive, the more time you need to take to receive it. So pause. But pause is also an acrostic that I've learned in Christian relationship counseling. This comes from Peacemaker Ministries. So this does have a Christian lean to it, but this can still apply in so many other cases. That is P-A-U-S-E, stands for different things. P, prepare. That is, pray, get the facts, seek godly counsel, or you could just say seek counsel and develop your options. A, affirm relationships. Show genuine concern and respect for others. Recognize that these people sending you negative feedback are actual human beings, and they need something, probably. You, understand interests. That is, identify others' concerns, desires, needs, limitations, or fears. S, Search for creative solutions, prayerful brainstorming, and E, evaluate options objectively and reasonably. Evaluate, don't argue. That's P-A-U-S-E. Prepare, affirm relationships, understand interests, seek for creative solutions, and evaluate options objectively and reasonably. I have these in the show notes over at theaudacitypodcast.com slash negative feedback for episode 190 and a link to Peacemaker Ministries where they describe this process a bit more if you want to check that out. But this is what we should be doing before we move on to any other actions. Prepare, affirm the relationships, understand the interests of everyone involved, seek for creative solutions, and evaluate these options objectively and reasonably. Check out the link in the show notes for episode 190. But this is before you move on, take this pause, take some time to really deal with these things at least 24 hours, but I recommend three days. So that's number three, pause, P-A-U-S-E. Number four, look for what you can learn and improve from the criticism. There seems to always be some kind of helpful truth, even in the most hateful feedback. And when we dig this out, we can find great suggestions for ways that we can improve what we're doing in order to better connect with our audience, present our content better, improve our production quality, any number of improvements that we could make, we can learn from the negative feedback. This sometimes means that we have to filter through all of the bad fluff where they say, I hate you, blah, 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 negative, 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 hate, 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 mean, 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 and then find that nugget of truth that we can pull and find something that we can then make as a a to-do list or make as a goal to try to improve that thing. Not for that one person, because they may be gone. 
they're most likely gone. If the more hateful their negative feedback is, the more likely they are gone and whatever change you make is not going to bring them back. But you can learn from this a way that you can improve your content and your presentation and production and everything else so that it benefits everyone else who is still there. If nothing else, if you can't find any possible positive thing that you can learn or improve from this negative feedback, at least you'll know that you're being hated for being genuinely you instead of being someone else. Don't use this as an excuse, though. If you say, um, a whole lot, and someone sends you negative feedback and says, you say, um, way too much, you need to stop that. It makes you sound stupid and dumb, and I'm no longer subscribing because you say, um, too much. Don't try to get that person back or reason with them necessarily, but you can take that to realize, yes, my saying um so much is not genuinely my personality. This is something I need to improve, a way that I can grow in my communication. I can still be genuinely me and authentic without saying um. So look for those ways you can learn and improve from the criticism. That's number four. Number five keep and revisit a praise folder of positive feedback. Whenever I receive a kind email, I tag it as praise and then I upload it to a notebook in Evernote for each of my podcasts. So that way I can always go back and see what nice things people have said. And you can use whatever tool that you want. It could even just be a folder in your email program or print things out on paper, hang them up on your wall, put them in a filing cabinet somewhere whatever it is that you need to do in order to collect these things. If you're a premium member of mypodcastreviews.com, then you have access to a new feature that's exclusive to premium members, and that is that you can quickly filter and sort all of your reviews. So you could see all of your just four and five star reviews through mypodcastreviews.com. And that would be a great way to see very quickly the nice things that people have said about you and about your podcast. And the reason you need this is it needs to be a reminder for what you are doing right in your podcast. So you don't start focusing on, oh, I'm a failure. Everyone hates me. No, you just have this folder where you can open it up and you see 200 emails from people that say, thank you so much for what you're doing. I really appreciated this. This really encouraged me. I was having a bad day and you made my day so much better. So many different things that people could say. And you've seen these things probably. And this is the best kind of feedback to keep around, that kind of stuff that reminds us why we're doing this thing and reminds us that people do genuinely appreciate what we're doing. The best kind of feedback is 10 parts praise to every one part of criticism. And I think you may see that same ratio in the feedback you receive, where for every one negative feedback, you have 10 positive, grateful, uplifting responses from other people. Keep this information handy so that you can prevent yourself from getting discouraged and feeling like giving up because you'll realize, yeah, this is one person didn't like these things. They're gone now, actually. So they're not going to be a problem anymore. Here are the 10 people that really do like what I'm doing. These are the 10 people I should be talking to. These are the 10 people I need to be improving myself for them so that they will appreciate and receive the content even better. This can also help you recognize what is worth fixing and what's not worth fixing. Because, for example, if 10 people tell you, I love your sense of humor, and one person says, you're not funny, stop being stupid and be serious in this serious podcast about business marketing. Well, you see, here's one person that didn't like your humor. Here are 10 people that do like your humor. So should you stop being genuinely you? Should you stop using humor in your presentation? No. 10 people said they like it. One person said they didn't. So that one person probably isn't your target audience anyway. I really respect people like Dave Jackson and Jeff Roney. And Dave Jackson is from School of Podcasting. Jeff Roney is host of the Once Upon a Time fan podcast. They have... A very unique approach. That's redundant, I know. They have a unique approach to how they present their content in their podcast. They're opinionated and they have fun with it. 
So when they do something in their podcast, yeah, some people will complain and say, oh, I don't like the way you do this, or why do you do that? You're, you're not doing the right thing, blah, 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 all of this stuff. Yeah, negative feedback. But the people who like them really like them because of that stuff that they do that is uniquely them. So keep and revisit a praise folder of positive feedback. That's number five. And if you need help with that for your podcast reviews, check out mypodcastreviews.com. Number six, remember your focus. Why are we podcasting anyway? Are we trying to change the world for better with education, entertainment, and other encouragement? Or are we so passionate about this topic that we just want to talk about it and hope that we can connect with other people who share our same passions? Or are you just trying to do this because you want your ego stroked and you want to see the nice things that people say about you? A negative review really shouldn't stop you from pursuing your goals. Imagine where Apple would be if they gave up after the first negative review. Right now, with this new thing, the Apple Watch, a friend of mine reminded me that the criticism about Apple Watch is very similar to the criticism about the iPad originally. People were saying, oh, the name is stupid, Uh, the idea won't work, blah, 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 all of this stuff. And now look, So many people have iPads that it's overtaking computer sales in certain industries and certain demographics, and the tablet market has exploded. So don't give up on your goal just because someone gives you some negative feedback. The negative feedback can help you in your focus, but don't lose track of that focus and think that because someone doesn't like what you're doing, you should stop and you should give up and you should do something else completely. Keep your eyes on your goals and don't let these things stop you. That's number six. Remember your focus. Number seven, go uplift someone else. Our initial reactions to the negativity will often be to either retaliate or take it out on someone else or just get depressed ourselves and focus on ourselves. Don't do any of this. If someone leaves a negative review, here's something that you could try doing. Go write a positive review for five other podcasts. Or if someone sends negative feedback to you, then go send positive, grateful feedback to other people you respect. This not only has powerful effects on the podcasters that you are contacting, because maybe they receive negative feedback on that same day, and you could help be that person that has helped lift their day up from the quagmire they were in. But this also has powerful effects on our own perspectives, because it's helping us take the negative experiences in our life and turn them into moments of positive generosity helping others because we were hurt. That's so foreign in many ways to us. And there is a strong biblical principle behind this, and that is to love your enemies, pray for those who despitefully use you and all of this. But the good practice is more than just pay it forward, because if someone gives you negativity, you don't want to pass that on. But take the negativity that someone gives you, flip it around to positivity, and pass that on to other people and spread it even more. That will change your perspective and you could be helping someone else. So number seven, go uplift someone else. Number eight, respond respectfully. This is almost the last thing that you should consider doing is responding to the negative feedback. And again, this is after you have paused, after you have waited at least a day, but I recommend three days. And that is to respond in some way to the negative feedback you've received. However you do this, do it in a respectful way and only when you are in that right mindset. This allows you to understand the person's feelings, be respectful of the time and the courage that they took to send something to you. They have to be pretty vulnerable sometimes to send some feedback with their personal email address or with their real name attached to it to point out these things, these negative things to you. And this can even help you respond in a thankful way for how they've helped you or helped us as podcasters in some way. Don't respond disrespectfully. I would even challenge you to think outside of responding publicly 
to the negative feedback in your podcast. Unless you're an entertainer and you want to use that for the sake of entertainment, yes, that can sometimes work and some people will just really enjoy that. But if you're a more serious podcast, a hobby podcast, a a business podcast, something more serious like that, you're not focused on entertainment and making people laugh, then be very, very careful with how you respond to negative feedback. The times that I have heard people publicly respond to negative feedback has always left a bad taste in my mouth. It's felt kind of like the person needed to defend themselves or like they're out to try and call someone out on the mean things that they said and embarrass the other person. I don't think that's the right approach that we should be taking in podcasting. We should be uplifting. We should be encouraging. That's not to say you can't be genuine and authentic, maybe even transparent a little, But this doesn't mean you need to respond publicly to the criticisms in order to defend yourselves. You could just say, hey, I got some negative feedback on this and I appreciate that and I'm going to be making some changes on that. Or you might not even have to announce anything at all. Negative feedback that I've received in the past, and I'm going to give you an inside look at some of the negative feedback I've received, but when I've received negative feedback and I've changed something as a result, I don't think I've ever announced that I was changing it. I just changed it and then waited to see if anyone either changed their opinion, if they were still around, which I didn't expect them to be, or if someone liked the change I made, or if no one noticed at all, and if I felt like it was a better change. But when you're responding, be respectful and be uplifting if you can in some way on your own. If you're still in a place where you feel like you have nothing good to say to this person, then prepare ahead of time for this. Maybe even right now while you're in a good mood, while you haven't received negative feedback, or maybe you're listening to this because you have received negative feedback. But when you're in a good place, write a message, a basic canned response that you can send When you're not able to say anything else, for example, you could say, thank you, Jim, for your feedback. I understand this matters to you, and I really appreciate the time you took to write this out. It may have been a little intimidating to say these things, but I really appreciate that you sent them directly to me. I'm always looking for ways to improve, so your feedback has given me some stuff to consider. Thank you. See, it's very respectful. You're not saying right away that, oh, this was horrible feedback, or I'm going to change these things, or why did you send this thing? You're not attacking. You're not being disrespectful. You're being very respectful, acknowledging that they took time and energy and courage to send this to you, thanking them for that, and letting them know that their feedback has been received, and you'll be looking for how you can improve from it. If you come up with a response like this while you're thinking positively, then you can use that in those cases where you just cannot think positively to contact that person. And if you receive a negative review in iTunes or some other podcast directory, and I'll mention how you can get those possibly removed in a moment, but whatever you do, don't write a review on your own podcast as a response to other podcast reviews. Number one, that's kind of sketchy to review your own podcast like that. And it's very likely if you review your own podcast, that Apple will see that and remove it anyway. But number two, it's not really useful in any way. No one who wrote a review in the first place will probably see your response in that way. I do kind of wish that we could respond to reviews in iTunes, or at least see email addresses that we could email these people. But then again, sometimes I think It's good that we can't because then it would turn us into people who go about trying to defend ourselves at every corner whenever there's the slightest bit of negative feedback that we have to defend ourselves. And I think that wouldn't help how other people perceive us. So number eight, respond respectfully. And number nine, remove the negative feedback if truly necessary. This is in extreme circumstances where the feedback really should not be publicly visible for many different reasons. And this could be on your own website, possibly on other websites, maybe even as a podcast review in iTunes. This is where there's some kind of violation of the rules or they're writing completely irrelevant information. 
like, for example, if someone was attacking the TV show Once Upon a Time and they left that as a review for my Once Upon a Time podcast, well, it's not relevant because they're not actually making a comment about our podcast. They're commenting about the TV show, so they should really be writing that review on the TV show, not on our podcast. But these kinds of things can be removed. Certainly, on your own website, you are fully justified to allow or forbid any content that you want. You could say things like personal attacks will not be allowed, profanity will not be allowed. And if you're in a public forum, even though it is a public place where anyone can come and post whatever they feel like, it is still your private property and you can make it follow your own rules within whatever legal limits there are and whatever the terms are to your web host. Certain web hosts will forbid certain kinds of content, but the chances of you running into that kind of content would be very rare. If you're looking at a negative review on iTunes, it is possible for you to remove it, but you really need to be discreet about this. Don't just think, oh, I don't like this review. I'm going to have it removed. Not that kind of thing. There are specific reasons iTunes will let you report a specific review in order to be considered for removal. Those four reasons are This review contains offensive content. This review is not a review or is off topic. I disagree with this review and my concern isn't listed here. And in each of these cases, you have the opportunity to write a message in there. I've had to do this for a couple reviews that have been left for a couple of my podcasts. This was where someone really had a vendetta against the world, it seemed, and wrote some really nasty, hateful, mean, bitter stuff, personal attacks hate speech, profanity, really bad stuff. And when you get something like this that really does truly deserve being removed, you can get your fans and your friends to help you remove this. I don't recommend that you say that in your podcast. Hey, everyone, would you help me please remove this? But go out to the community that you trust, the people you know do like you, maybe even your friends, and ask them, hey, can you help me get this removed because it just really doesn't need to be in there. It's going to offend a lot of people. It has nothing to do with what we're talking about. Can you help me get removed? I've had to do this with a couple reviews on my shows, and I've also helped a couple other podcasters get reviews removed from their shows for these same reasons, but it's a very, very rare occurrence when you would want to have a review removed from iTunes. So don't even think of that as an option if it's a negative review. But that's number nine. Remove the negative review if truly necessary. And number 10 of all of these other nine things I've given you, number 10 is, or just ignore the negative feedback. Yeah, you could just ignore it. Don't be disrespectful in how you ignore it, but there are people who just don't like how we do things. And we're not going to win them back by changing things and being unauthentic or not ourselves in some way. They're already gone, so making the change in order to appease them is really wasting your time. And it could alienate the people who are left. Instead, make a change that helps make the experience better for everyone else who hasn't left yet and who still appreciates what you're doing. Sometimes you might get feedback that's basically, when you really look at it, you realize the person is basically saying, you are bad because you're not like this other person. You should be more like this other person and then you'll be good. No, you should not. You should be you and no one else. Yes, we can try to improve ourselves. Yes, we can learn from other role models. Yes, there are things that we can strive to do that other people are doing too, but don't try to be other people. Don't try to do something just because you see someone else doing it and they're having success. That doesn't mean that their success can be attributed to that thing they're doing. That thing they're doing could actually be holding back their success, as much success as they might be having. So don't look at these role models and say, oh, they do it that way, so I need to be like them. You be like you and don't let people or don't listen to the people when they tell you, you should be like this other person. 
you be yourself, but still look for those ways that you can improve your content, your presentation, your production, and your promotion. And in podcasting, what's so great about this field is that there are no rules. Aside from technical requirements, there are plenty of recommendations and guidelines. But we, as podcasters, must have the guts, the boldness, the courage, the audacity to podcast. And sometimes that means ignoring the negative feedback. That's number 10. So this list of 10 steps for how to deal with negative feedback is number one, don't get depressed from negative feedback. Number two, don't feed the trolls. Number three, pause. That stands for prepare, affirm relationships, understand interests, search for creative solutions, and evaluate options objectively and reasonably. Number four, look for what you can learn and improve from criticism. Number five, keep and revisit a praise folder of positive feedback. Number six, remember your focus. Number seven, go uplift someone else. Number eight, respond respectfully. Number nine, remove the negative feedback if truly necessary. And number 10, or just ignore the negative feedback altogether. These are 10 steps toward dealing with negative feedback. I'd love to hear your comments and how you've dealt with negative feedback, or maybe you're dealing with some negative feedback right now and these things can help you. Please comment on the show notes for episode 190 by going to theaudacitypodcast.com slash negative feedback. September 30th is National Podcast Day, and since I'm recording and publishing this episode in September... I'm celebrating National Podcast Day by giving you an inside look at how I handle some stuff in podcasting. I've done that for the last couple episodes, and this episode will contain also an inside look that is even maybe a little bit vulnerable to you. I am my own customer for my podcast reviews. I use it a lot myself and love seeing the reviews and ratings from other people on on podcasts I listen to as well. I follow some of their ratings and reviews. And what I did is I logged into mypodcastreviews.com since I'm a premium member (laughs) and I filtered it so I would see only my one, two, and three star reviews. And here are some of those things that other people have said. This is not me defending myself, but I want to be transparent, even vulnerable a little bit to you to let you hear some of the other negative reviews and what I have learned from some of these things and even changed in some cases. From Aussie Jack in Australia, July 1st, 2010, he said, tends to waffle on a bit, but generally not bad. Second to the podcast answer, man. Cliff has been doing it for a while now. If Daniel has the long-term passion, he will only get better. Go, Daniel. Congratulations. That's a three-star review. And back in 2010, that was a month After I launched three stars, I think it was, yeah, I deserved it. I did waffle on a bit. And even later on, you'll hear that through some of the other things, including this next review. This was on August 3rd, 2011, a three star review from podcast Hokodai cast from Japan. The subject is wade through to the info. When I started listening to the Audacity podcast, I wanted to improve my knowledge of the hardware and software involved in podcasting and video casting. This podcast has that information, sometimes presented clearly, sometimes not. If you can wade through the talk, the information is valuable, useful, and timely. If you're a beginner podcaster, the Audacity to Podcast can help you get started. He presents things clearly and repeats himself so that you don't have to rewind to catch his instructions. Good for beginners and people easily distracted. Why I get irritated listening to the Audacity to Podcast, sometimes... It takes the host a long time to get to the point. If you like tangents and, quote, funny, unquote, asides, tap is for you. If you want to be constantly reminded that he has another podcast and a network, tap is for you. I've stopped counting the number of times he mentions his other podcasts in one show. If you want your information front and center, you're barking up the wrong tree. Why I stopped subscribing to tap, the August 2nd, 2011 show, number 44, I fast forwarded through 11 minutes, 11 of self-advertising, asides, chit chat with himself, reminders of his other podcasts and reminders to listen to show whatever for more information. He finally said, let's get to it. And then went off on another tangent. Click, whirl, unsubscribe. Tap may be just the podcast you're looking for. Chatty, informative, 
easygoing. I'm sure he has many listeners. I listened while I drove to work, and an hour podcast is too long, especially when it can be reduced to 30 minutes or less with no loss of information. But if you like a friendly, I like his voice, by the way, talkative and informative host, check out the Audacity podcast. Both of these reviews had something in common, and that is that they said it took me a while to get to my point. And I had these long asides, I had long intros. These are great lessons, and I've applied that so much. And later reviews reflect that they say, I love that Daniel gets right to the point, or he gets into the content right away at the beginning of the podcast. And this is something I try to do in every episode. Sometimes I have to give an introduction to the content, but I'm always making it the content or the introduction to the content, not stuff like, please review me on iTunes, please send me feedback, I've been doing this new personal thing, blah, 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 all of this stuff. I might tease you to say, I just launched something really cool, I'm going to tell you about it at the end, or I give you a quick little bit at the beginning, but I want to get into that main content as quickly as possible. That's something I've learned from these couple negative reviews. Here's a one-star review from Australia on August 27th, 2012, written by Gayra. It says, one minute of information wrapped in 30 minutes of self-promotion. This podcast has almost no content. It's a merciless listener grab and affiliate marketing attempt packed with worthless buzzwords like how to and top five, but it doesn't deliver. He seems like a nice guy, and I'm surprised he would try to treat people as naive cash cows and listener statistics. And the sound has a constant whine slash hiss behind it. Unforgivable for a podcast that's about podcasting. I think that Gayra's first episode may have been number 94. You can go back and listen to the audacity to podcast.com slash 94. That episode was all about how you can make money with the Audible affiliate program. And throughout it, I mentioned my own affiliate relationship and my own affiliate links that were contextually relevant. And I've heard far more gratefulness and success reports from that episode. People who are saying, thank you for letting me know about that. I've been making money with the Audible affiliate program. So much more for that than the criticism for promoting my own affiliate relationship or talking about affiliate relationships with this. So I think that if that was Gera's one and only episode, I can understand why he or she would get that perspective. And the hiss behind the recording, that was good for me to discover that someone else noticed that because I realized live streaming the video of my recording sessions was causing my computer to rev up with its CPU fan get really loud, and that loud fan noise was making it into the recording and degrading the quality of my recordings. And I realized, yeah, that's a good point. A podcast about podcasting needs to have really good audio. So that's where I decided to stop live streaming the video of my sessions, or at least I do it very rarely, until I get a better computer that can handle that kind of processing and not make so much noise. This three-star review is from... Dennis McC-K from the USA on September 14th, 2012. He said, pretty good, but Daniel covers a lot of good information, but several aspects bother me enough to unsubscribe, but feel free to judge for yourself. Number one, one of the first tips I remember is to be prepared and research anything you're not sure about because nobody wants to hear you trying to remember some detail but I've lost count of how many times he has mentioned something that's either this or that. I'm not sure. Let me respond to that first. That's so true. And I realize, wow, I say that a lot. And so I've worked harder to make sure that if I need to refer to something that I'm not confident about, that I pause my recording, make sure I'm confident and come back and present it confidently. Then he goes on. Number two, the top number lists are really annoying when he goes over the entire list so far before each new item. Repetition can reinforce memory, but what about that last few that don't get repeated as much? Great point. I also heard Dave Jackson kind of sideways critique me in one of his episodes where he talked about podcasting pet peeves on School of Podcasting, and he said the 12 days of Christmas approach where you 
list all of them over again, backwards, forwards, whatever order. And I realized, yeah, those last few things only get mentioned a couple times then. So I try to make sure that now when I do a list, every item gets mentioned the same number of times and I'm not doing the 12 days of Christmas approach to my list. Number three, he continues on, I found this while looking for tips on using Audacity, but much of his content leans more toward podcasting, which is not for me. That's fair enough. That's a consequence to using the word Audacity in the title. And it's always been a podcast, primarily about podcasting. Secondarily, it had a lot of Audacity information in the past. And then number four, he said, call me a grammar Nazi. Is there a more politically correct term that avoids the N-word? But his grammatical mistakes, while certainly fewer than some other podcasters I've heard, are just enough to bug me. Great points. I really appreciate these things. I wish I could know what some of these grammatical mistakes are because I am a grammar snob in some ways and maybe even a grammar Nazi in some ways. And there are certain things that really bug me. Some things I let slip. When I say it, I realize ah, that didn't come out the best way, the most grammatically correct way. But you get the point. I want to move on. I don't want to stop and re-say it. I don't want to create an edit point. Maybe that's a little bit of my being lazy. But since having John do some of my audio editing, I do allow myself to correct myself more often to make a smooth editing point to make a smoother presentation then. Here is a three-star review from Mrs. Louise Benjamin in Minnesota from the United States on February 15th, 2013. She said, I feel like I've just listened to an hour-long infomercial. Daniel, I recognize your need to cross-promote, and I realize that your income comes from podcasting. I feel overloaded with commercial information and had quite a difficult time separating out the real content from the commercial content. It's just too much. Sorting out the things I would consider using and the things I have tried in the past that didn't work from the commercials just wasn't worth the hour I wasted this afternoon listening to your podcast today. Please accept my apology, Luis Benjamin. I have Luis's email address and tried multiple times to reach out to her so that I could understand what part of my content it was that seemed like an hour-long infomercial because I couldn't tell which episode she was referring to. Because at that time, I couldn't figure out what episode she had last listened to anyway. So I couldn't see which one had this problem. I really want to improve. I really hate being all self-promotional and infomercial-like and all of that. I try to only mention my products and stuff at the end of great high value content or when it's contextually relevant like earlier in this episode a couple times i mentioned my podcast reviews because it was extremely contextually relevant but i didn't go off on a big long commercial about it but mentioned it when it made sense i think in a couple episodes there have been times where i did spam some information in too many contextually relevant places like every time i mentioned my podcast reviews saying my podcast reviews.com something like that Now, that wouldn't have been the actual case back then, but it could have been something else like that. Like I kept giving the domains when it was already obvious. Yes, Daniel, we know noodle.mx. Shut up and get on with it. So I can understand maybe that's part of what contributed to it. But now I work harder to ensure that when I'm presenting information and I self-promote certain things here and there, that it doesn't distract from the main content. And one last review here. This is a two-star review from Jessalon from the United States of America on July 24th, 2013, said, Not a fan. Daniel, the way you breathe into the mic is incredibly distracting, and you sound awkward. I couldn't get past the first episode. I have to laugh at first because this says the first episode. And you know what the first episode of any show you've ever done is like. The first episode is sometimes the most embarrassing episode because that's where you're just not even finding your voice yet. You might have had bad equipment then, bad mic technique, anything like that. So I can totally understand first episode. The breathing thing, by the way, I'm aware of an odd thing that my breath does sometimes where it bounces, or it's not, that's the best way I can describe it, or it kind of like cuts out as I'm breathing. And it can sound a little bit weird. I try to take note of when it happens because it can be extra distracting because it just sounds 
weird. It's like a cutoff breath and then another breath immediately after that. So I try to remove these things. And also I try to be conscious of how much my breath is making it into the recording. And different ways that I work with that are working with my hardware compressor limiter gate, turning my mouth away from the microphone to take a breath sometimes, just like chocolate rain kid, or maybe just not being so close to the microphone or breathing in more slowly, breathing in through my nose or any other number of techniques that could help me not let those breath sounds in. I especially hate it when I see in the audio waveform at the beginning of my episode, I see this and then welcome to the, I hate seeing that and I'll actually remove that. Removing every single breath would be ridiculous because then I wouldn't sound human at all, but I do want those things to be reduced. So these reviews that I shared with you are the reviews I collected from my podcast reviews. I didn't withhold any of them. These were my one through three star reviews and that I filtered through my podcastreviews.com and all of that. Your reviews may be even worse than this. I've certainly seen some terrible, terrible reviews that other people have left on other podcasts that are just so hurtful that it makes me think, how could you say that? Don't you realize there's a human reading this? Do you really need to be that mean to them? But each of these reviews that I read did sting the first time that I read them. In fact, that review from uh, Gera from Australia hurt enough that it inspired me to send an email to my subscribers way back then. This was back in 2011 or so, or really early on in my email list. I think I only had 200 or so subscribers to my email list. And I sent this email out just kind of walking them through. And I'll have a link to that in the show notes for this episode number 190. But I just walked through my process of overcoming the negative feelings from the negative feedback. And it was that review from Gera that was the thing that hurt because it was basically accusing me of what I worked so hard not to do. So you might receive negative reviews that are like these, maybe even much worse. But I hope that these 10 steps that I've given you will help you to work through that process and come out with a better podcast on the other side. Come out connecting with your existing audience who does still like you, but connecting with them even better. So once again, that list of 10 steps is, number one, don't get depressed from negative feedback. Number two, don't feed the trolls. Number three, pause. Number four, look for what you can learn and improve from criticism. Number five, keep and revisit a praise folder of positive feedback. Number six, remember your focus. Number seven, go uplift someone else. Number eight, respond respectfully. Number nine, remove the negative feedback if truly necessary. And number 10, or just ignore the negative feedback altogether. I'd love to hear your stories, your experience, and your tips on dealing with negative feedback. Please go to theaudacitypodcast.com slash negative feedback to comment on the show notes for episode 190. And I'd love to see what you do that helps you or maybe how this has helped you deal with negative feedback right now that's over at the audacity slash negative feedback september 30th is national podcast day and i'm excited about this and what's going on it has been declared a holiday and just because it's national doesn't mean it's not international because to every country there's a national if you're in canada there's a national if you're in the united kingdom there's a national so make this a podcast day wherever you are go out ask people what's your favorite podcast record it Go to the website, nationalpodcastday.com, to see how you can participate in this and further podcasting. If you need help launching or improving your podcast, please email or just ask your questions for the podcast by emailing feedback at theaudacitypodcast.com. You can also call and leave a voicemail at 903-231-2221 or send a voice message through the website, theaudacitypodcast.com. Now that I've given you some of the guts and taught you some of the tools, It's time for you to go launch or improve your own podcast for sharing your passions and finding success. I'm Daniel J. Lewis from theaudacitypodcast.com. Thank you for listening.
The Audacity to Podcast is a proud member of Noodle Mix Network. Find more of our award-winning and award-nominated podcasts to make you think, laugh, and succeed at noodle.mx. We've got a new podcast coming into the network to help you as a woman be productive in your personal life or in your business life. But we also have Beyond the To-Do List. We have Once Podcast, our Resurrection Podcast, Under the Dome Podcast, Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Podcast. 